The subject of today's session follows quite directly on the heels of our last session in the book of Isaiah. Last session, we discussed chapter 7 and the beginning of chapter 8. And we continue with chapter 8 and into the beginning of chapter 9 today. Although to some extent, as we've already noted, where we draw the breaks between one session and the next is sometimes a somewhat arbitrary call. Likewise, as we've also noted, drawing the breaks between chapters in Isaiah is often a somewhat arbitrary call. The division of the book of Isaiah, like essentially every book of the Bible, with the exception of the Psalms, is a very late division that does not necessarily reflect our traditions, which is why in our discussion last session, we included the first four verses of chapter 8 in our discussion of chapter 7. The common denominator, it was all in a particular historical context, same historical context as it is now. The historical context being in the reign of King Ahaz, not just the time frame, a global political situation of turmoil. The kingdoms of northern Israel and Aram are both in skirmish, maybe more than skirmish, with the kingdom of Judah. And while these relatively small kingdoms, Aram, northern Israel, Judah, they're all, in this time frame, not very significant global players, are involved in this infighting among them. There is the great threat looming on the horizon with respect to all of them, and that is the rising power of Assyria in the east, northeast. It's in that context that we saw in our last session the reassurances of the prophet Isaiah to King Ahaz and his cohorts in the ruling class of Judah to keep calm, to not be concerned with the threats of Aram and northern Israel, rather to appreciate that these two kingdoms are heading for imminent doom. And furthermore, the instrument of that doom is Assyria. You don't need to call in Assyria. Don't engage in reaching out to the beast that is lurking at the horizon because that beast will be coming soon enough. And that sets the stage for the continuation of these prophecies in the continuation of chapter 8 and into chapter 9. Whether these passages were all presented by the prophet Isaiah to his contemporaries at once, or whether they were separately presented and then conjoined when the book of his prophecies was edited, of course, we don't know. But inevitably, I remind us all of a cardinal principle in studying the words of the prophets that we have noted on many occasions, starting with our first session on Isaiah, and that is, if we are to understand the prophet's message to us, and it's a prophet. It is included in the Bible because the prophet's message is also to us. We first need to understand the prophet's message as it is in its terms, geared as of course it was to the prophet's contemporaries. By understanding what the message is, 
we can then ask inevitably the second question, what is his message to us? So, let's consider the message here. And consider in particular the somewhat changed focus that served personally for me as the dividing line between what we discussed heretofore in this section of Isaiah, chapter 7, first four verses of chapter 8, and what we discussed today. From chapter 8, verse 5, and into chapter 9. This is the beginning of chapter 9. The first six verses of chapter 9, because they clearly connect with what's taking place here. Beginning in chapter 8, verse 5, And God spoke unto me yet again, saying, Yet again, this is separate prophecy. This is not the prophecy of reassurance to the leaders of Judah, reassuring them that Aram and northern Israel are not a threat and are in fact headed for their own ruin. This is a message, as we see presently, regarding the threats from within. For as much as this people has refused the waters of Shiloh that go softly and rejoice with Ritzim and Ramal Yahu's son, the reference obviously being to those parties in Judah who were a kind of fifth column who were disinclined to follow Ahaz and the Davidic dynasty generally, and were rather inclined to side with Judah's enemies, namely Ritzim, king of Aram, and Remaliah's son, Hekach, the king of northern Israel. Why were they so inclined? Well, we get something of an answer to that in considering the metaphor of refusing the waters of Shiloh that go softly. Of course, the most obvious thrust of the metaphor is compared with the great rivers. As anyone who has been to Jerusalem knows very well, the Shiloh Spring, which is still to be found, as it always was, on the southern slopes of the Temple Mount, what was the city of David, is a relatively minor spring. It's minor, that is, when we consider the major rivers. It was very significant for Jerusalem because it provided the source of water for Jerusalem's inhabitants. And yet, it goes soft. It's not a river flowing with a torrent, with might, and with all of the drama that might be found elsewhere. Ritzin and Remaliah's son, Pekach, are the kings of the rival kingdoms, Aram and northern Israel, who are intent upon seizing control of Judah and with the pooled resources of these three kingdoms, challenging the emergent empire of Assyria in the east. So these people want to join with Aram and northern Israel. And the prophet tells them for their disdain of the Shiloh, this minor spring that maybe signifies the king of Judah's concern for peace and quiet, for attending to the needs of survival of his people, the people of Jerusalem. Remember, Shiloh was always a strategic asset because that's what provided the water. That's what kept the city alive. But they're not interested in the Shiloh. Well, what they're going to get instead, continuing the metaphor of the river, in verse 7, Now therefore, behold, God brings up upon them the waters of the river. We'll note that in the Bible, 
the river, without any further description, generally refers to the Euphrates, the major river in the east. Mighty and many, even the king of Assyria and all his glory, and he shall come up over all his channels and go over all his banks. They are not satisfied with the soft moving waters of the Shiloh, they'll end up with a torrent. Well, more than they may have bargained for. And he shall sweep through Judah. Not only obliterating the rival kingdoms of Aram and northern Israel, which will both be destroyed by this torrent of Assyria, it will also threaten Judah. Overflowing as he passes through, he shall reach even to the neck. Stretching out of his wings shall fill the breadth of your land, O Emmanuel. Now, of course, we note that in the dramatic illustration of this metaphor, the river threatens, but at least in Judah, it doesn't destroy. It reaches even to the neck. And of course, the one who was caught into the river, all the way up to his neck, is in deep trouble, but not drowning. Judah will be at least partly overrun by the onslaught of the Assyrian Empire. But Judah, in contrast with the rival kingdoms of Aram and northern Israel, will survive. God has promised. O Emmanuel. Emmanuel, as we saw, is the name of the child born to the young woman who in the context appears to be none other than the prophet Isaiah's wife. Emmanuel, as we've also noted, means God is with us. Judah will be saved. God is with us. Now, before we continue, I'd just like to make one additional observation here, and that pertains to this expression, this people. And I think the thrust of this people, the expression in Hebrew is Ham Hazer, is particularly significant as we contrast it with Immanuel, God is with us. I call our attention to this, we'll see in the coming verses the same expression appearing yet again. Because the expression, this people, appears on a number of occasions in Isaiah, and what, for our purposes, perhaps especially germane, is it's interesting, in every single instance, it has negative connotation. The first place where we encountered the expression, and we saw this already, was in Isaiah chapter 6, where God says to the prophet, Go and tell this people, hear you indeed, but you don't understand. See you indeed, but you don't perceive. Make the heart of this people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes lest they, seeing with their eyes and hearing with their ears and understanding with their heart, return and be healed. They don't want to be healed, this people. And we indeed see much the same motif in the continuation of chapter 9, what we'll be discussing about going in our next session. In speaking of the leadership, they that lead this people mislead and they that are led of them are misled. Again, there's a problem with this people. We see the same motif yet again in Isaiah chapter 28. In verse 11, for with distorted speech and with a strange tongue shall be spoken to this people. And it's in the context of an indictment. Likewise, in verse 14, hear the words of God, you scoffers, and allegorists of this people 
which is in Jerusalem. Saying we have made a covenant with death, very negative associations with this people. And the final instance in which we encounter the expression in the book of Isaiah, in chapter 29, which I think is especially instructive, verses 13 and 14. And God said, For as much as this people draw near, hey, they're drawing near to God. And with their mouth and with their lips do honor me. Sounds pretty good so far. They're honoring God, but only with their mouth and with their lips. But have removed their heart far from me. And their fear of me is a commandment of men learned by rote. Therefore, behold, I will add confounding obscurity to this people. Obscurity upon obscurity. And the wisdom of their wise men will be lost. And the prudence of their prudent men will be hid. Again, when we consider the thrust of this people, it is evidently in contrast with people who are God's people dedicated to God's word, people who are more aptly described, you recall, with the expression that pertains to Isaiah's son, Immanuel. God is with us. The God being with us is not unconditional. If this people think they're on their own. There's people over there without God. If God is not with us, then we are doomed. And indeed, the prophet continues with his vision of the calamities that are in store in the world ahead. Returning to our chapter, chapter 8, verse 9. Join together, O you peoples, and you will be broken in pieces. Give ear, O you far countries. Gird yourselves, and you will be broken in pieces. Gird yourselves, and you will be broken in pieces. This applies, of course, to Judah's immediate rivals, because Aram and northern Israel are going to be broken in pieces. It applies likewise to that looming danger on the horizon because the destruction of the Assyrian Empire follows closely behind. And so with respect to all of these events swirling around Judah, verse 10, Take counsel together, and it shall be brought to naught. Speak the word, and it will not stand. Ki Immanuel, which we can translate as, for God is with us. Again, Immanuel, the same words that are the name of the child that is born to the prophet's wife. For God is with us, the Hebrew can also be rendered as when God is with us. And of course, arguably, it really amounts to the same thing. Because when you say it will be brought to naught, it will not stand, for God is with, not, with us, that really makes it clear, doesn't it? It only works when God with us. Indeed, this theme that ultimately it is God's plan that perseveres is one with which we are very familiar from other verses in Scripture as well. In Psalm 33, verses 10 and 11, God brings counsel of the nations to north. 
he makes the thoughts of the peoples to be of no effect. Verse 11, the counsel of God, in contrast, stands forever. The thoughts of his heart to all generations. And in very similar words, in Proverbs chapter 19, verse 21, there are many thoughts in a man's heart, but the counsel of God, that shall stand. So, what inevitably determines whether the plans of our enemies persevere or not? Are we on the side of the counsel of God that stands? Can we indeed state Immanuel, God is with us? I feel compelled to share with you. Maybe you're aware of this on your own, but in the uniform of the soldiers of Nazi Germany. Do you know what was engraved on the belt buckles? God is with us. God is with us. If they would have engraved those words in Hebrew, it would have been Immanuel. It obviously, God is with us, isn't some glib assurance. We can do whatever we please because God is with us. Rather, when we are worthy, because we are with God, then God is with us. And then, of course, the protection that results from the counsel of God, that will stand is the protection that saves us when God is with us. In that vein, we continue back in our chapter, back in chapter 8. Another passage, another element in God's prophecy to Isaiah. In verse 11, For God spoke thus to me with a strong hand, admonishing me that I should not walk in the way of this people. Remember, this people. Saying, this is the message that God gives the prophet. Say you not a conspiracy concerning all whereof this people says a conspiracy. Don't follow them blindly. Neither fear what their fear is, nor stand in awe of it. Don't take your marching orders from the masses that are labeled here, this people, with what we already saw, were the negative connotations of this people, this people who are on their own over there, this people. Not God's people, not the people who are standing with God. Rather, the God of hosts, him shall you sanctify, and let him be your fear, and let he of whom you stand in awe, God. And when you do that, when you sanctify the God of hosts, then reciprocally, in verse 14, he shall be for you a sanctuary. That is, in the Hebrew, you sanctify God, and he becomes the place of sanctification, a sanctuary. And yet, Ironically, perhaps terrifyingly, his becoming a sanctuary means he is a stone of an obstacle and the rock of stumbling to both the houses of Israel, for a jinn and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. What's going on here? 
This is a sanctuary? A stone of obstacle? A rock of stumbling? And of course, inevitably, the answer is, it depends. It depends because when God is the sanctuary in our midst, sanctuary is a refuge. A sanctuary is a beacon of holiness. Yeah, but what about those people who are turning their backs upon holiness? What about those people for whom God's presence will amount to an indictment? Because they have no association at all with that which is holy. They're not standing with God. And so inevitably, God isn't standing with them. Immanuel, God is with us, doesn't apply. It is, if you will, a double-edged sword. In much the same vein, in the very last word of the prophecy of Hosea, Hosea, in chapter 14, verse 10, Whoso is wise, let him understand these things. Whoso is prudent, let him know them. For the ways of God are upright. And you know what that means? Since they are upright, the righteous will walk in them. But transgressors stumble in them. The same ways of God. For those who are righteous become the means through which they are able to walk. And for those who are not, for those who are rebelling against God's word, the self-same ways are ways of stumbling. And that is, of course, inevitably, precisely, what we see here. Back to Isaiah chapter 8. Verse 15, and many among them shall stumble and fall and be broken and be snared and be taken. It's all a question of what you value, where you stand. Do you stand with God? Because only then does God stand with you. It's after all a reflection. And since, of course, inevitably we recognize the prophet is conveying this message to these people, the people who aren't standing with God, the people who don't want to listen. We continue in verse 16. Bind up the testimony, seal the Torah, the teaching, the instruction, among my disciples. They're not ready to listen now. Maybe you just need to bind it up, seal it. And the prophet conveys the message to his students, to God's students. Because they'll maintain it, they'll preserve it for the future when people will be ready to listen. In much the same vein, we get a similar message in Deuteronomy chapter 31. When God tells Moses in verse 16, Behold, you are about to lie with your fathers. Your death is imminent. And this people, again, it's this people, doesn't always have a negative connotation, but here undoubtedly it does as well. This people will rise up and go astray after the foreign gods of the land into which they come and will forsake me and break my covenant which I have made with them. And what follows 
of course, it's calamities. My anger will be kindled against them in that day. I will forsake them, and I will hide my face from them. And after all these things happen, eventually, the people recognize, are not these evils come upon us because our God is not among us? Again, God emphasizes, I will surely hide my face in that day to all the evil in which they have come. And the message in verse 19, Now therefore, write this song for you, and teach it to the people of Israel, put it in their mouths, that this song may be a witness for me against the people of Israel. The interesting question is, what is the song? A simple answer would be, this is Deuteronomy chapter 31, Moses' song. Deuteronomy chapter 32 is the song to which verse 19 refers, which is one possibility. Another possibility is the entire Torah is called song. And indeed, all of the words of the Torah are that witness for God against the people of Israel when they failed to obey. I feel compelled to share with you that in our tradition, these words, now therefore write you this song for you, which is a phrase cast in the plural, not only addressed to Moses, is taken as the very last mitzvah, the very last commandment that we read in the Torah, the commandment for us to write a book of the Torah, a copy of the Torah, for us to be inspired, guided, to serve as a witness. And on that theme of witness, again, we continue, verse 20 here in Deuteronomy chapter 31. When I shall have brought them into the land which I swore unto their fathers, flowing with milk and honey, and they shall have eaten their fill with wax and fat, and turn unto other gods and serve them, and provoke me and broke my covenant, then it shall come to pass, when many evils and troubles are come upon them, that this song will testify before them as a witness. For it shall not be forgotten out of the mouths of their seed. Now, of course, on the one hand, clearly testifying as a witness is a very scary idea. And in context, it's clearly part of the indictment. And yet simultaneously, you know, there is a silver lining, as it were. There is an implicit consolation in this verse. And I think this also pertains to what we see in Isaiah chapter 8. When God says, it shall not be forgotten out of the mouths of their seed. Isn't that a promise? The Torah will never be forgotten from Israel. They may turn their backs. They may rebel. They may do terrible things. There will always be something that draws them back. This song, the Torah, that will testify before them as a witness, will always be present within them. It will never be lost. It will never be forgotten. It will always be there. And returning in that vein to the words of Isaiah, again, Bind up the testimony. Seal the Torah among my disciples. Don't let it be lost. And it is perhaps precisely by consequence that the prophet reacts in verse 17 on an optimistic note. I will wait for God who hides his face from the house of Jacob. I will hope for him. Note, 
that expression, hiding his face, is identical with the expression that we saw in Deuteronomy chapter 31, verses 17 and 18. I will hide my face from them. I will surely hide my face in that day. A sobering thought. But still, the implicit consolation. Since my binding of this testimony is to ensure that the testimony endures and they will eventually heed it, I will wait for God. I will hope for Him. And I know I will never despair. And furthermore, even though God is hiding His face, the prophet adds, verse 18, Behold, I and the children whom God has given me shall be for portents, tokens, in Israel from the God of hosts who dwells in Mount Zion. That is, God is hiding his face, but there are still the words of the prophets. Isaiah is saying, I and my children are here in order to embody, to personify God's word, God's promises. Well, we don't have the prophet or his children directly in our midst today. But what we do, in the words of Isaiah, that is, even when we experience God's hiding his face, we're not plunged into total darkness. As long as we realize that we have this testimony, the words of the prophet that continue to reassure us that this testimony will ultimately persevere. Now, bearing this in mind, verse 19 conveys to us kind of counterpoint with respect to what we just saw. And when they shall say to you, Seek unto the ghosts and familiar spirits that chirp and that mutter. Should not a people seek unto their God on behalf of the living unto the dead? The expression here, indeed, the original Hebrew, is somewhat obscure and difficult to decipher. But the simple import seems to be that the way you should be seeking from your God's guidance in times of calamity is inquiring of the dead on behalf of the living, seeking unto the ghosts and familiar spirits. Now, obviously, we have a lot of difficulty relating to even the suggestion. I'm sure I speak for most of us in expressing grave skepticism as to the effectiveness of any kind of appeal to ghosts or familiar spirits. But the message is still germane to us in that when we consider just what this solicitation means, let's consider its implications in terms of what the Torah tells us about precisely such forms of divination, categorically forbidden. In Leviticus chapter 19, verse 31, Turn you not unto divining by the ghosts, nor unto divining by familiar spirits. In Leviticus chapter 20, verse 6, The soul that turns unto divining by the ghosts, and unto divining by the familiar spirits, to go astray after them, I will even set my face against that soul, and will cut him off from among his people. Talking about God hiding his face. Here God does not hide his face. God exacts punishment for engaging in this behavior. And indeed, in verse 27, in the continuation of Leviticus chapter 20, a man or a woman who divines by ghost or familiar spirit will be put to death. It is a capital offense. We'll note, on a historical note, that the king, who is perhaps singularly described as exemplary, of evil and wickedness, Menashe, king of Judah, who in 
The second book of Kings, chapter 21, verse 2, is described as he did that which was evil in the sight of God, like the abominations of the nations whom God cast out before the children of Israel, is described subsequently in verse 6 as, among other things, appointing them that divine by a ghost of familiar spirit, with all the implications with respect to violating the word of God. And the other side of the coin, the righteous king Josiah, Yoshiahu, is described in the second book of Kings, chapter 23, verse 24, as having put away, abolished them that divined by ghost or familiar spirit and the various other detestable things that were spied in the land of Judah and in Jerusalem. Josiah destroys these things. We're identifying here a practice that was entirely illicit and in violation of God's word. But now when we consider just what is so detestable in such conduct, well, first of all, we do see the extent to which it's conduct that is associated with idolatry and moral bankruptcy. In Isaiah chapter 19, in verse 3, in the context of a prophecy that forecasts retribution and destruction to Egypt, we read, And the spirit of Egypt will be made empty within it, and I will make void the counsel thereof. And they shall seek unto the idols and to the whisperers and to the diviners by ghosts and to the diviners by familiar spirits. And I will give over the Egyptians into the hand of a harsh lord and a fierce king shall rule over them, says God, the God of hosts. Mind you, this retribution that is at least in some way the retribution for seeking to the diviners by ghosts and diviners by familiar spirits is not limited exclusively to the Egyptians. In Zechariah chapter 10, verse 2, and the context here is the renegades in the people of Israel. The prophet indicts for them as well. The teraphim have spoken vanity and the diviners, soothsayers, have seen a lie. The dreams speak falsely, they comfort in vain. All these forms of divination are categorically useless and destructive. And maybe that brings us to a heightened appreciation of just what is so bankrupt in these attempts at divination. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, we find these forbidden forms of divination consulting a ghost or familiar spirit as part of a long list of forbidden practices. In verse 10, we read, There shall not be found among you anyone that makes his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, one that is a diviner of auspicious times, a diviner of omens, a sorcerer, any of the various forms of divination, or a charmer, or one who consults a ghost, or a familiar spirit, or a necromancer. For whoever does these things is an abomination unto God. And because of these abominations, God is driving out those nations who were in the land from before you. It is as punishment for the depravity that is expressed in such divination. What's so depraved about it? Why indeed does God forbid these practices? Maybe the first and most critical key to answering this question is to be found in the very next verse. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 13. In contrast to all of these forms of divination, you shall be wholehearted with God your Lord. 
Meaning what? Well, we see in the continuation of the passage, in contrast to these forms of divination, in verse 14, as for you, God your Lord has not suffered you to do all these things. Rather, by contrast, in verse 15, a prophet will God your Lord raise up unto you from the midst of you, of your brethren, like me, unto him you shall hearken. You listen to the words of the prophet. And again, this theme is reasserted in what follows. In verse 18, I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren, like unto you, and I will put my words in his mouth, says God to Moses. On the one hand, of course, if you have prophets, you don't need such forms of divination. But I think there's a more critical message, and it is a message that is simultaneously of great relevance to us as well. We don't have prophets walking in our midst today. So what are we supposed to do? And the key, undoubtedly, returning to verse 13, you shall be wholehearted with God your Lord. Being wholehearted means I don't need to figure out what is going to be through an appeal to all sorts of illicit practices that may or may not even be efficacious. Of course, there's no guarantee they'll even give me the truth. And that theme, indeed, is one that we encounter in Isaiah chapter 44, where we read of God in verse 25, as he who frustrates the tokens of the impostors and makes diviners or soothsayers mad, who turns wise men backward and makes their knowledge foolish. But the truth of the matter is, of course, you have no way of knowing what is going to be. But simultaneously, and most critically, if you trust in God, you don't need to know what's going to be. You know that there's a captain of this ship. You know there's a judge of this world. You know there is someone who has written the script. Even if we don't know what scenes lie ahead, and we have no way of deciphering how many scenes there are and how terrifying some of those scenes may be on the route to the final blessed conclusion. We know that someone was running the show. Being wholehearted with God means any appeal to these so-called mechanisms for establishing what will be is misguided, irrespective of the extent to which these vehicles even work. We don't need to know. All we need to know is that indeed there's someone in charge. And I'll add here, even with respect to the words of the prophets, note that there isn't any implication anywhere in the description of the words of the prophets that they are going to give you a soothsaying that they're going to tell you the future. Rather, on the contrary, what's the emphasis with respect to the words of the prophets as expressed in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15? Unto him you shall hearken. He's not telling you what's going to be. He's telling you what to do. He's telling you how to live your lives. He's telling you how to stand with God, because only thus can you legitimately aspire to Emmanuel, that God is with us. And so, on that note then, returning again to our chapter, Isaiah chapter 8, when they say to you, Seek unto the ghosts and familiar spirits. In verse 20, 
What you reply to them is, rather, we hold to the Torah, the teaching, and to the testimony. Remember testimony. It's actually the same word in the Hebrew, tit-uda, as what the prophet was bidden to bind up. Bind up the testimony. Seal the Torah teaching among my disciples. So that Torah and that testimony, that is what we hold to in our response to those who say, let's get busy with divination to figure out what's going to be. We're not concerned with what's going to be. We're concerned with what we are doing now. And are we standing with God? without him. Surely they, the ones who are obsessively running to seek unto the ghosts and familiar spirits, they will speak according to this word wherein there is no light. And what follows in the next three verses is what I can only describe as an image of abject terror. What in contemporary jargon, we might describe as a dystopia. Verses 21, 22, and 23. They shall pass through the land, hard oppressed and hungry. And it shall come to pass, when they shall be hungry, they shall become enraged and cursed by their king and by their god, and turn upward, implicitly, seeking aid from above, and shall look unto the earth, and behold trouble and darkness, the weariness of oppression, and shall be driven into thick darkness. For there is no weariness to the one who oppresses her. At the first time, he has likely afflicted the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward he has dealt a more grievous blow by way of the sea beyond the Jordan in the Galilee of the nations. The sea in context obviously being the Sea of Galilee. What is the prophet describing here? Manifestly. This is, indeed, beginning with the land of Zvulun, continuing with the land of Naphtali, the encroaching doom of northern Israel by the hand of the Assyrian Empire. So that with all the prognostications, with all of the, let's see what we should be doing now. Should we be siding with Aram and northern Israel in order to unite against the threat of Assyria? Should we unite with Assyria in order to be able to combat our local enemies of Aram and northern Israel? And the message of the prophet is, we should hold to the Torah and to the testimony. That's not to imply inaction. That is rather to recognize that ultimately what will determine our fate is whether God is with us. And what will determine whether God is with us is whether we are with God. So, with respect to this progression, we see, on the one hand, the encroaching darkness, the calamity. Assyria is sweeping into the region. And... Immediately afterward, we continue with the beginning of chapter 9, where chapter 9 clearly is following on the heels of this very destruction. And we read these words, this dystopian description of calamity, and then we read at the beginning of chapter 9 on a completely different tenor. The people that walked in darkness 
have seen a great light. They that dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them has the light shined. The theme that ultimately there is indeed the shining of the light is something we see resonating in Scripture in Psalm 112, verse 4, unto the upright he shines as a light in the darkness, gracious and full of compassion and righteous. Note, this is critical. The people going in darkness who see that great light, they are who? They are the upright. They are the ones who stand with God, with whom God stands. Immanuel. And continuing the theme, and verse 2 makes it dramatically clear what event the prophet is describing here. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased their joy. They joy before you as the joy in harvest, when they rejoice, when they divide the spoil. What spoil? Of course, in context, we realize this is a description of the ultimate fate of the Assyrian Empire after they reach up to the neck. Remember, we'll see this later on in Isaiah as we did likewise in the second book of Kings, that the Assyrian Empire does sweep into the land of Judah, even laying siege to Jerusalem. And one night, a single night, the angel of God goes forth in the encampment of the Assyrian Empire and 185 thousand soldiers perish and the siege is gone. And again, you multiply the nation. As the joy in harvest, when they rejoice, when they divide the spoil, for the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as in the day of Midian. And you know, the theme of the joy of the harvest, we can't help but relate to the words of Psalm 126, verses 5 and 6, They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. Though he goes on his way weeping that bears the measure of seed, he shall come home with joy bearing his sheaves. There is that promise. So long as we're worthy of it. And then, indeed, then every shoe of the stormy warrior, or alternatively, all the weapons of the fighter in the battle's tumult, or every victory shout sounds with clamor, whatever it is, the might of the enemy, every cloak rolled in blood shall even be for burning, for fuel of fire. Almost evocative of the description in Ezekiel of the aftermath of the Battle of Gog and Magog, when all of those weapons are simply kindling, because from all of the hordes that streamed into the land to do battle against God and his people, nothing beyond kindling is left. And finally, in the wake of all of that, when we consider this entire progression began at the beginning of chapter 7 with the house of David under threat. And then we read in chapter 9, verses 5 and 6. For a child is born unto us, a son is given unto us, and the government is placed upon his shoulder, and the wondrous advisor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, called his name the Prince of Peace. Judah will be spared. <laughs> 
And even though we look around and see the swirling tempest, the storms raging all around, there will be Prince of Peace. To him who increases the government and for peace without end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to establish it and to support it through justice and through righteousness from henceforth even forever the zeal of the God of hosts performs this. So what happens? What happens of course ultimately is yes, Judah is saved. And this child who is born unto us will herald that peace that is restored to Judah. Now, of course, as we noted at the beginning today, the words of the prophet are intended first and foremost for his contemporaries. The prophet lived in his time. The words of the prophets always have a context historically and a specific address. And the passage under discussion, of course, is among the more blatantly anchored in time in Isaiah, because we see a particular geopolitical situation that elicits the prophet's words. The whole area is in tempest, Judah beset by enemies on all sides. And the passage begins with battles, wars, and ends with the Prince of Peace. The passage begins with King Ahaz flippantly disregarding the words of the prophet. The passage ends with this child who is born unto us, who, in context, since, after all, the government is placed upon his shoulder, we may conclude is indeed the heir to the throne. The heir to the throne of Ahaz, of course, being the righteous king, Chizkiyahu, who in many ways really does emerge as the Prince of Peace. So, of course, on the one hand, we understand the progression in this passage, teaching us about reliance upon God, about not relying upon the various fleeting treaties of peace and war with Judah's enemies around northern Israel or Assyria, because ultimately none of them will be our salvation. Salvation comes from only one address, from God. And, we stress, from God, when Emmanuel, when God is with us, when we're with God, when we make ourselves worthy of God being with us. No! That throne of David is supported through justice and through righteousness. Justice and righteousness, when we stand with God, He stands with us. And of course, inevitably, once we appreciate this as the key message that Isaiah is presenting to his contemporaries, we can well appreciate this is, of course, the key message that Isaiah is presenting to each and every one of us. I'm afraid in our time, we can only too well identify with the geopolitical situation. Storms all around us, especially from our vantage point here, back in Jerusalem. We see storm winds all around us, around the land of Israel, around us here, and even 
within Jerusalem. Those who still wish to do battle with God and his people. And the challenge, of course, inevitably, as always, is not so much with respect to them, but with respect to us. Because we still don't need any appeal to the soothsayers and diviners or their modern equivalents, the pundits, the experts, the prognosticators, the strategists, not to say that we don't have to do our utmost to plan for whatever circumstances confront us. But, well, let's face it, we're not the ones who are going to be making these geopolitical decisions anyway. And even for those who are, the critical question is and remains. Emmanuel, is God with us? Are we with God? Do we recognize this critical message of the prophet? Do we appreciate this is the determinant? Are we with God? Because when we are with God, we know through both storm and calm, God is with us. And that, after all, is the greatest lesson. God bless you.